feel the Wednesday energy. Uh, we'll, we'll start uh, what will be a, a uh, multi-class uh, journey to Antarctica uh, today with some, uh, some penguins. Uh, these are chinstrap penguins. You can probably see why they have that name. And they have a, a sort of soldierly uh, appearance in, in this photo. You can see a, a zoomed out of the, uh, the colony of, of chinstraps on this rocky island. And they uh, can strike a, a martial pose. They sometimes try and eat a small shellfish from the surf or, or drink seawater. And uh, they're pretty noisy. They uh, make a lot of noise in groups. They make a lot of noise by themselves. They make a lot of noise at each other. Um, but they also court each other and, you know, inevitable results. And uh, these, these rocky islands where peng uh, these penguins live are just kind of very striking uh, locations with uh, big glaciers and whatnot. So more, more Antarctic creatures to come. Uh, but that's today's. Uh, what questions do you have about uh, the lab, uh, allocators, anything that we've been, we've been working on? Michael. Um, I have for uh, the active to a no-op instruction, meaning that the CPU can execute a byte 90 as an instruction and it will just do nothing. Uh, this might be helpful if for uh, aligning purposes or, or other things you might want a, a byte that does nothing. It's helpful in the case of these gadgets because it means that there can be these 90s around and they, uh, and they will not have any effect on, on what the program actually does. Other questions? All right. Would like to start off with another spreadsheet example. This time bringing in the kind of boundary tags uh, that I mentioned at the end of last class where we're going to have each block have both a header and footer that records the total size of the block and whether that block is allocated or free. And I'm representing that here with the size, bitwise or, and then one for allocated, uh, zero for free. Let me zoom out so we can see the whole, whole thing here. So uh, this first row is an example of what our implicit free list uh, uh, might look like at uh, when the heap is first initialized. We have uh, eight bytes of padding for alignment purposes. We have a prolog block that has no payload. It's just a header and footer. And it's, so it's total of 16 bytes and it's allocated. We have one large free block that makes up our heap, and then this special epilogue block, which is size zero and marked as allocated. The purpose of the epilogue block is we're using the sizes as our way of getting from one block to the next. So we know where the, the prologue block starts. It says size 16. That lets us get to this next block, says so size 128. That lets us get to the next block. And once we hit a block that has a size zero, we know that we've reached the end of our heap. And so we wouldn't keep searching. So we need something to tell us when we have reached the end of the heap. A size zero uh, uh, header is, is one way to do that. When we have a request come in, A equals malloc 24, 
we first say, okay, we need a payload that's at least 24 bytes. And then we also need the header and footer. So our <coughs> block size is going to be the amount that's requested plus some amount of overhead, which in this case we have 24 and we have a header and a footer, each is 8 bytes, so that's 16 bytes of overhead. That's going to be 40, and then we need to take that and round it up to a multiple of 16. So that's going to give us 48 bytes total. So that's how big a block I need to find. So then I will start searching my implicit free list for a block that, uh, that will suffice. Start with the prolog, go six, that's allocated, can't choose that one. Go 16 bytes forward, look at that header. It's free and it's big enough. So we'll go ahead and allocate this one. And at this point, what we do now depends on our splitting policy. So we have a block, a free block that's 128 bytes. We're looking for one that's 48. And so what are some different decisions that we could make in terms of uh, what to actually allocate? John? You could just allocate like, the first 48 blocks. Yes, so we could we could split the block into however much we need, 48 bytes, and however much is left over. and allocate the left of the two things we split. So we split off the kind of start of the block to meet our request, and the rest is going to be free. Uh, is there another possibility, another decision we could make here? Oh. We could split and put the 48 bytes at the end of the block and have the free part be be the beginning. Any other possibilities? Elliot? Split into three groups and put our block in the middle. <laughs> uh, true. I can't think of a reason why we would want to do that, but yes, we could put our, we could split multiple twice and put our block kind of anywhere in the middle. Uh, John? If, do we not know what the status of the blocks beyond like, if we know this is all kind of free, is there a reason we would want to put the block on the right as opposed to the left, or like the left as opposed to the right? Like, how are they functioning differently? Uh, so, putting it on the left or the right will affect what it might be later combined with as it's free. And so we might just always allocate it on the left or always allocate it on the right or do some combination of the two, sometimes left, sometimes right. And so this will be one of, uh, uh, one of the things you might think about when you get to optimizing an allocator in lab four is, is there something interesting we can do uh, with where we place, uh, how we do the splitting. But I will say we have another option. Let's not do any work. Let's just allocate the whole free block. The user gets more than they ask for. Doesn't hurt them. 
So that would be that would be another another choice to to not split. Um, and we might have different conditions. We might say if if the amount that we're splitting off is small enough, then maybe we just allocate the whole thing. So let's just, for the purposes of this example, do this first one, split it, and allocate the left hand side, which means I'm going to split this into something that's 48 and allocate it. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight byte chunks. This needs to be the right font. And then what's left over is a block of 80 bytes that is free. And I need to make sure to change the footer of my original free block as part of this splitting process. So I change the original header and the original footer and put in a, a new footer and header for the two blocks. So I'm going to, yes, do this here. And so this 48 is what we're allocating. We return a pointer to the start of the payload of that block to the user. And so the payload that we've given them is actually 32 bytes. They asked for 24. So as long as we give them at least as much as they asked for, they, they have no reason to complain. Uh, but this is an example of internal fragmentation because we have an extra eight bytes beyond what they requested that we're including in the block. In this case, because we rounded up to a multiple of 16. Questions on this so far? John? Is there a place we could, like, is there a way to mitigate that rounding problem? Like, could we just keep it as a, a 48, like a 40 sized block, but then just start it in a place such that it's 16 aligned? Like, to keep the, the buffer outside of the allocation, basically? So, uh, question is, could, could we keep this as just 40? and then deal with the alignment in some other way. So keeping this request as 40 would not affect its alignment. It would affect the alignment of the next block. So then, we, so then we, yeah. So they, yeah, when it comes to rounding up to a multiple of 16, we just have to do that. Uh, the other sources of internal fragmentation in this picture are this header and footer. This is extra space we're using on the heap that's not serving a, a particular request. And so there might be things we could do to avoid header, uh, uh, having to have both header and footer. Other questions? All right, we have our next request, uh, B equals malloc of 36. This is the state of our heap. And so again, we need to compute our uh, our total request size, that's 36, plus our overhead of 16, uh, gives us 52, which we have to round up to 64. So now we're looking for a request of, of 64. Start at the prologue, that's allocated. Use the size to look 16 bytes later. Look at that header, it says allocated, so we have to keep looking. It says go 48 bytes forward from this address. We get here, it's free, it's big enough for 64. So we have found a block that will work. Now, if we do the same split that we did before, we would end up with 64, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then what was would left what was left over would be sixteen bytes. Could if we did this split, could we use this free block to meet any request? No. There's 
all of the space in this block is consumed by header and footer. There's no space in it for, for, for the payload. So splitting this off is only fragmenting our heap for no reason because we split off part of a block that can never be used to meet a request. And so we just have this little bit of memory that's free, but is kind of breaking up the heap in a way that's not helpful. So, we would like to avoid So in this case, what we prefer to do is to just allocate the whole 80 bytes. So to say, okay, change the header and footer to make it allocated. I'll color it blue. And we return a pointer to the payload. John. So is that, is this, better just because it's faster or easier to deallocate it later. Like functionally this is pretty similar, right? In the sense that like you won't be using the space either way, but at least this way you're not like recombine the blocks. So it saves us a bit of work that way. It's also the case that any time we go to find a block to meet a request, we are traversing all the blocks. And that, that have headers and footers. So if we're splitting off things that are useless, that's just adding to the number of things that we might have to traverse. So we'd like to avoid that. It's also the case that in the lab, there are, if you have these two small blocks sitting around, it's, uh, a, they, they are often a source of bugs in that, um, uh, Typically, the code in the allocator assumes that all blocks are at least the minimum size. And so when you have a block that isn't, there are parts of the code that will, will cause sig faults or overwrite things that they shouldn't because they're assuming blocks are always minimum size. Lucy. So uh, our minimum size that we always do for like like and then our size that we uh, so, 32, so yeah, so our, our minimum size is our overhead, which is 16, plus 16, because we need a, a payload that's a multiple of 16. Uh, yeah, so under this scheme, our, our minimum size is 32. So that's, what if you have that 16 byte block uh, for in the middle? So, like, you had uh, if for some whatever reason you didn't bring something and uh, now you've got the 16 bytes left over, but instead of it being at the very end with no more space, it's potential that that space could then be combined when the next thing is free. Yes, yeah, so this is, Silas makes an, an interesting suggestion that if we had instead done our, let's not do that. If we ins had instead done our uh, 64 byte block, put B here, and then had our tiny uh, block in the middle, we can see the allocator doesn't know this, but we can see we're about to free A, and having this here would allow this to be combined with, with that into a larger free block. So that might actually uh, result in, in, this could result in better utilization because the more we can combine free memory together, the larger requests we can, we can satisfy. But if the allocator did this, it would need to 
be very careful that there may be free blocks that are not the minimum block size. Um, and for a different kind of free list than an imp implicit free list, this would be uh, this would be a serious complication. Elliot. Couldn't the extra 16 bytes at the end also help us? Like, we knew we were going to be expanding the heap at some point. So that, like, we just kind of have 16 extra bytes to carry over for the next trunk? Uh, that's that's another, another fair point, that when our heap runs out of space, we're going to call sbreak to move our break pointer off in some large chunk, like 4,096 bytes uh, uh, up, and slap a 4,096 byte block, free block on the end of our heap, and then we might coalesce that with a little bit of free memory that's at the end. So that would also work. Um, and so the, the other kind of free list that I'm going to talk about today actually uses the payload of free blocks to maintain extra information, which is why a block with no payload uh, is going to make that a lot more complicated. Um, but in this implicit free list, yeah, we could uh, experiment with these, allowing these smaller blocks in different places, and I think it would just depend on the actual sequence of requests, whether that help, ended up helping us or not. Other questions? All right, I will put this back to 80. Then we go to uh, free, uh, free A. We're given uh, uh, the pointer A that malloc previously returned to the user, which is the start of the payload. So we would go one word back, eight bytes back from the pointer passed into free to find the header. We change that header to be free. No. Uh, and then we'd say, okay, the footer is 48 bytes minus 8 away from our, our header. So if we went 48 bytes forward, we'd get to the start of the next block, and then we go one word, 8 bytes back from that to find our footer. Change that to be free as well. And... We've completed our, our free of, of A. Aaron? Just to clarify, if you had information in that block, that still could be there. This is not the point. Uh, exactly. That we don't do anything with the payload bytes in this case. So they have you know whatever the user put in there, uh, and we don't care what that is. What? Is there like a map on a box that has a block for you? Uh, so the uh, the maximum the maximum block size is uh, not likely not going to be uh, determined by the allocator. It's going to be determined by how much heap memory the operating system will give to the allocator. So someone create uh, requests like 10 trillion bytes with malloc. Uh, malloc says, well, I don't have enough heap space for that. S break, give me 10 trillion more bytes on the heap. Operating system says, no. Uh, and then malloc is like, well, I couldn't find a block, and it returns null allocation code. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's the operating system will be enforcing some constraints on the memory use of, particular, uh, of a particular program, and that's what would, would limit the block size. Other questions? All right. So then, last step here, we have free B. Given a pointer to B, go. Uh, um, eight bytes back from that, find our uh, our header here, and then we can change that. Go 80 bytes forward minus eight to find our footer. Change that. And that's now free. 
Is this, is this good? Is this the state we want our heap to be in? No, we now have, if a request for 96 bytes come in, comes in, we're gonna think we can't meet it even though we can. So, in fact, a step that I have uh, skipped over for these free is our is our coalescing policy, which is just combining adjacent free blocks together into a larger free block. So we actually have two, I guess, three different uh, uh, approaches to coalescing. Uh, we have the one that's on the screen now, which is, we don't do it. It's probably a bad idea but it does make free slightly faster if we just don't bother to check. And the main decision that we actually have is when do we do coalescing? Do we do it immediately? Every time we free a block, we check its neighbors, can it be combined? Or, at the point where, so say this, we, we don't do it immediately. Now a request comes in for malloc 96, as I was suggesting. We look through the whole heap, we can't find any block big enough. And so at that point, we go through the whole heap and combine any adjacent free blocks we find. So basically, we save up all the coalescing work for the moment when, we, when it might help us meet a request, or we do it immediately. John? If we defer coalescing, couldn't that create a situation where, like, let's say we had a request for, like, 76 bytes or something, couldn't that create a situation where we get, like, more fragmentation because the, the allocator is like, oh, we have an 80-byte block, let's put it here, and then we're, like, splitting things further apart rather than having like an efficient splitting policy because we don't know like how much free space we actually have. Uh, I would agree. The, the point that could this defer create additional fragmentation because we end up with more split blocks definitely seems a possibility. So I, I would say it's not clear which of these is, is the, I, I think that it's not the case that one of these is always better. It may be in certain situations one performs better than the other. It, Do you defer it every time um, it doesn't have enough memory? So like, say you requested 90 bytes over here and it didn't have enough memory, so it would just go in and defer all of them. Um, yeah, so this, this deferred approach is, the, the immediate says when we free a block, we check its neighbors, we combine with the neighbors that we can, and since we're doing that every time we free, we know that any free block on the heap has al only allocated neighbors. Because if, they had, if it had free neighbors, it would have already been combined. Deferred says we're not gonna do all this work of checking the neighbors when we call free. We're going to wait until we can't find a block big enough, then go through and combine all the adjacent free blocks and so, if it's the case that we never actually need to do coalescing in order to meet the request of a particular program, then we have saved ourselves all the work of unnecessary coalescing. And we may have made the average call to free faster by not coalescing each time. But uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, is one preferred over the other depending on how big, um, or sorry, that won't make any sense because it's memory. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it would be situation dependent which of these might perform better. So, how do we go about coalescing? That's my, my next sheet here. We have four different cases when we go to coalesce. So 
I have here arranged vertically instead of horizontally blocks on the heap. And so this one in the middle that says freed block, this is the thing that we're calling free on. And it's a block of size n. So its header says size n, one for allocated, footer size n, one for allocated. And then there's a block before it and a block after it, which have sizes m1 and m2. So the first, uh, Sean? Is there any way to make this bigger? Let's see if, I think it can go up to, uh, yeah. We go up to 200, we can still probably see one of these. All right. So uh, in this first case, well, in each case, we need to check the block before it on the heap and the block after it. And one question is, how do we actually find the relevant, relevant information about the previous and next block? So I'd like you to take uh, a minute or two and discuss with your neighbors. What we have is a pointer to the payload. That's what free is called with. And so what would you do, given that pointer, to find out if the previous block is free and find out if the next block on the heap is free? Does the size in our header and footer include the eight bytes for the header and the eight bytes for the footer? Yes. The size needs to include the whole block because when we use the size to find the next block in the heap, we actually need to get to the next right. block, which involves going past the header and, and footer. Okay. So ideas on given this pointer x, which is the address of our, our payload, uh, the, the total block size that has this payload is, is b. Uh, how do we go about finding the, the previous, whether the previous block is, is allocated or free? Okay. Uh, go back 16 bytes and check the last bits in that group. Exactly. That if we go 16 bytes back and our heap, we'll find the footer of the previous block, which is going to tell us both the size of that previous block and whether that previous block is free. Um, question? I was going to say, like, if we if we just cared about whether or not it was empty or not, we could just do x minus nine. But if we need the size, then sixteen is better. Yeah, we 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 will we will definitely need the size. How about the, the next block? All right. X minus eight plus the size that that's found that it now has. Yes, we we. Go back to our header, and then if we add the size, the total size of this, this block, which I said was, was B, which we would also get from the header, um, that will take us to the header of the next block. Again, tell us whether the next block is free, whether it's allocated. Questions on that? All right, let's talk through our for cases for coalescing, we have the one where we can't coalesce, where we look at the previous and next, find that they're both allocated, and we just make the block that we're freeing free, and that's all, that's all we do. Another case, the block after the next block is free, previous is not. So we check both of those, we find, okay, next is free, and so to coalesce them, we just need to set up a new header and footer for the combined block. So we change the header of our free block to have the new combined size, n plus m2. And then we change the footer of the next block to have that combined size as well. So now we have a header for our n plus m2, footer for n plus m2, and we have these old header and footers which can just chill in the middle because we don't have to care about what data is, is inside uh, our blocks. Is there a question on that? Okay. 
So our, our other two cases proceed uh, similarly. Previous is free, but next is allocated. We again update the header and footer for the new combined block with the new combined size and also mark them as free. So we would use our uh, technique for getting to the footer of our previous block and then we can use the size of that previous block to find its header which is going to be the new header for our combined uh, combined block update that with the combined size update the footer of the freed block with the combined size and our last case is when we can is when we're freeing a block that's between two already free blocks we want to combine all three together uh, and we similarly update the header and footer for the entire new combined block. Eric. Is that done together where you combine the first two first and then check the next one and then combine the bigger first one and the first one? The question is do we combine them all at once or do we say combine the free with the previous and then once we've combined those combine it with the next? Either would work it would be more efficient to combine them all at once, to actually have our code do these exact four different cases. Combining not at all, with previous, with next, or with both. Because there's a set of just a, a, a few updates we need to do for each of the different cases. So there'd be no reason to do it twice by kind of doing it piece by piece. John? It's like, is, is the time saved by combining it all at once? significantly larger than like the time loss in the cases where we check both but only one is available. Like I assume it would be right like the, the the saved efficiency of combining is worth you know having to well, I guess you're checking either way though. So yeah we, we have to check either way so uh, I mean I don't think this is this would have a huge impact uh, but I think there's no reason we wouldn't want to just do it all at once. Other questions? All right. There's uh, one uh, more sort of policy that I've just sort of been assuming a particular choice, uh, but we might also consider Placement policy, which is where, when we're looking for a, a free block, how do we decide which free block to use? So, the one that I have been using in these demos so far is called first fit. I go through the blocks on the heap, the very first one that can be used to meet the request. I go with. We could also kind of take the opposite approach and try and find the best fit, meaning uh, the free block that is the closest, that is big enough to meet our request, but otherwise is the closest in size to, uh, to our request. And so this requires potentially a lot more searching through our heap as we need to kind of check. Unless we find something that fits exactly, we are going to end up checking everything uh, uh, in order to, to determine which block is the best fit. Uh, but this is our trade-off of throughput versus utilization. That finding the best fit is going to be slower, but we may use memory more efficiently, have less fragmentation. There's one more policy we might choose, which is like first fit. So first fit is going to always start searching at the beginning of the heap and search forward from there. Uh, but 
if we end up with a lot of allocated blocks at the beginning of our heap, we're always having to go through all the allocated ones before we get to the ones that are free. So in theory, maybe a search that starts from wherever we left off in, the, in our previous uh, search through the heap to find an available block. We kind of keep track of an extra memory address that's the address where we ended our previous search and we pick up from there. In theory, we might end up with our allocated blocks more evenly distributed throughout the heap, which might make the average number of blocks we have to search through smaller. Empirical tests kind of are are mixed for the performance of NextFit. It seems like logically it might be better, but in practice it's sometimes worse than first fit. But it is another, another design choice that, that some allocators might make. Questions on the, on the placement? All right, so let's do, yeah, I want to make sure I, I get through this, so we'll, we'll skip that for now. Uh, there is a big problem with our, our implicit free list, and that is, let's say we have a long-running program, and we end up with thousand allocated blocks in various points on our heap and 10 free blocks somewhere in there. How many how many blocks does our, our implicit free list need to search through uh, if say these 10 free blocks are um, towards the end of our heap? Yeah, it has to search through all, uh, like almost all or all of these thousand allocated blocks, none of which are at all useful for meeting a future request in order to, to start looking at, at the free blocks. And so we really like some heap data structure that lets us, you know, jump to, to only search the free blocks when we're looking to meet a request because those are the relevant ones, not the allocated ones. Our implicit free list can't do this for us because the connections between the blocks are just based on the ones that are adjacent in memory. So we're sort of stuck traversing linearly through the blocks on our heap. But what if we had a linked list of just the free blocks. If we had such a list, then we could just search that list when we need to meet a request. And in this scenario, we search 100 times fewer blocks for each call of value. So now we're faced with the, the issue of we'd like a, li a linked list or some way of, uh, could, be, could also be a tree, some other structure, but some structure of, of free blocks. Uh, but one of the requirements of our allocator was that it only used memory on the heap, which means that we can't have this linked list sitting somewhere else in memory that's keeping track of our, our free blocks for us. We need it to be part of the heap. So this is where our explicit free list design will come in. 
are our allocated block will be unchanged from our implicit free list. We'll still have size with our one bit for allocated or free, same with a footer. And payload or padding in the middle. So our allocated blocks un unchanged. But free blocks, we have the observation that, well, when a block is free, it means no one is using it. And if no one is using it, we can do whatever we want with the payload because no one is using it. That memory is ours to play with. So we'll still have our I guess in the allocated case, they'll be allocated. And the free block, our bit will be, be zero for free. And inside the payload, <clears throat> we'll use the first 16 bytes of each free block's play payload to implement our linked list. And so our free blocks will contain the address of the next free block in our linked list and the address of the previous free block in our linked list. And so now, instead of starting at the beginning of our heap and going through every single block in it, we keep track of what is the head, what is the first block in our free list, and we just use these next pointers to search through the free blocks. Uh, and so now we're searching just, say, our 10 free blocks instead of all 1,010 blocks on the heap. What's that? You keep track of that somewhere else in the heap? Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. Where? Uh, where would we keep track of the head uh, of our list, Christian? We make we in our prolog. Is our, is our prolog allowed to have like an extra 16 bytes in the middle that we can put a pointer to the head of our link list? Yeah, I like that idea. Let's use some space on the heap for our the head of our list. We could put it in the prolog. Oh, on. Could also be bytes we use for alignment that are that are Exactly. Wouldn't you know, we have these eight totally unused bytes that we had just there for padding. Well, let's use them. So we could just store the address of the first block in our free list in this eight bytes at the start of our heap. So the next pointer going to the next payload or the next size? So the question is, is this next, and for that matter, previous pointer, are these pointing to payloads or are these pointing to, say, headers? Uh, either would work. Um, I think the what I find easier to work with is if the next if is if they point to payloads because then the next pointer points to the next pointer, the, the address of the next pointer in the, in the next block, but it's um, like either would work because if it points to a header, you know to go eight bytes down from there to find the next pointer or 16 bytes down to find the previous. Other questions? Yeah. 
Oh. Is there a reason to double link with stream next day? Like, can't you just fill in with the next day? Yes, that is a good question. Do we need it to be a doubly linked list? So here's a situation we need to think about. Uh, first observation. The order of blocks in our free list is not related to the order they appear in memory. So in assuming that we had, say, a 48-byte free block and an 80-byte free block, pretend they're not next to each other so we wouldn't have combined them. Just because the 48 block comes first in memory doesn't mean that it's first in the list. And so these, these next pointers kind of might jump all over the heap, just wherever the free blocks are. So let's say that we have, um, here I will pull this up. There are some slides that go over this. So when we have our uh, explicit free list uh, looking something like this, where the head uh, points to um, uh, the first free, free block in our, our list, which has, uh, which next pointer points to uh, uh, the next free block, its previous pointer, which is this red, will be null because it's the head, it has no, has no previous. Uh, and we want to free uh, a block here, we'll tend to want to, we'll, we'll want to, any block that's free, insert it at the head of our free list, because that's what we have a pointer to. We're maintaining a pointer to the head. And we know how to insert at the head of a free list. We wrote that code in lab zero. So we insert that as a head. Its next pointer refers to the old head. Update the previous pointer of the old head to point to the, to the new head. So, so far, previous pointer isn't, isn't helping us out. But when we need to coalesce under this explicit free list, um, we uh, uh, need to be able to, uh, we, we have a block that's in the free list. And uh, we want to combine it with some block that's adjacent to it in memory. If it's say if we're combining it with something with a, a previous free block, then its next and previous pointers will end up in a different spot. Need to be in a different spot in memory. And so, the simplest way to handle this is to remove the block that's being coalesced with from the free list combine it with the one we just freed, and then insert the combined one back into the free list. And when it comes to removing something from a linked list, a previous pointer is very helpful. Because to remove something from a, a linked list, what do we need to, what do we need to do? <coughs> Sam? Take the previous and the next. Yeah, we want to take the next pointer of the node before us and have it refer to the node after us. And so we need to be able to get the node before us in order to do that, so a previous pointer is, is useful because we're going to want to be removing things from, from our linked list. Here. So you're saying we move it from the list and then after we combine it, add it, add it. Uh, add it to the head. We'll, we'll always insert new free blocks at, at the head of our list. Uh, yeah, so we're freeing some block. Its neighbor in memory is already free and thus is already in our free list. And so we're going to want to remove that from the free list, combine everything together, and then insert it back at the head of the free list. 
Chris. Uh, that's right. Yes. That uh, uh, the block that we're freeing happens to be adjacent to an already free block. That already free block, yes, could be anywhere in our in our free list, and that gets to kind of list order and memory order uh, unrelated. So uh, that that's a good a good question. Would we need to traverse through our linked list to find this this free one? Uh, in this case, we have our, a pointer to the block that we're just about to free, and we just we can we know we're coalescing because we're looking at the block that comes right before it in memory. So we already have the address of that block because it's next to the one that we're freeing. And in order to see if we needed to coalesce, we had to, as we talked about, kind of go back 16 bytes to find the footer of the previous block. Uh, and so we already have the address of, of this thing. And so we're just using its next and previous pointers to remove it from our linked list. Other questions? All right, let's talk about uh, lab four. So uh, uh, lab four, um, I will connect to Mantis. If you have not, by the way, filled out the lab partner survey, Please do that today. I'll be sending out emails uh, to folks who are, who are matching with a partner uh, later today. Uh, so if, uh, please, uh, please fill out that survey by going to my uh, directory on Mantis. I've already downloaded the Lab 4 handout. Lots of files in here. The main one that we care about is mm.c. This is where we're going to implement our, uh, our allocator. There's, um, oh, let me make this code actually visible. So there's some starter code in here as well as these uh, comments that describe the sort of uh, boundary tag and prologue and epilogue that we've been talking about. And uh, the, initial, uh, the initial code is a very basic allocator. It does, uh, importantly, it does uh, no freeing and it does no splitting. And so it just finds the first free block, which will be 4,096 bytes, allocates the whole thing, and then any future request it uses sbreak to get another 4,096 to make that request. <laughs> so as a consequence, uh, if I uh, compile it and then uh, run the M driver program, which uh, runs the 11 provided uh, tests, which are just some sequence of, of uh, malloc and free. Uh, you see that for the last four, uh, last five actually, it ran out of memory. Because it called sbreak so many times it hit the limit of how much your allocator is allowed to use. Uh, so it turns out not doing freeing and not doing splitting, uh, not gonna cut it. What this actually tells you is did, uh, is your allocator correct for that particular trace? What was the memory utilization for that trace? How many operations were there and how many seconds did it take, which translate into how many thousands of operations per second was your, did your allocator perform? So this utiliza average utilization and average throughput in terms of operations per second translate into a performance index out of 100. If I do make test, 
that will compile and it will run uh, the auto grader, which will just basically do what I just did with mDriver, uh, but it will show you how that translates into the score on the lab, where there's four, uh, 40 points for having the traces be correct, actually not just returning 16 byte aligned addresses, returning the right size of things, not crashing, uh, and then the performance index out of 100 is the percentage of the 45 performance points uh, that, that you will earn. And then there are 85 auto-graded points with 10 from style and 5 from the check-in post. So my advice, uh, so the, my advice is extensive. The lab write-up is many pages because I put lots and lots of advice into, into the lab write-up. To boil it down, start by implementing an implicit free list. The textbook has code for an implicit free list. Kind of in chapter nine, uh, the dynamic memory allocation. Now, the textbook's code is not 16 byte aligned. It's 8 byte aligned, so it's not exactly. But start with the implicit free list. The textbook's a good resource for thinking through. So that's a lie. What you should really start with is there are a set of preparatory exercises in the write-up. And there'll be solutions to these posted on Moodle. They're not graded. They're not required. But I strongly recommend working through those as a way to make sure you understand how the implicit free list should work. It will end with doing some pseudocode for the implicit free list functions. And so, once you do an implicit free list, you should be getting a performance index of around 50, which will translate into about an 80% on the lab. And that's because our implicit free list has will have pretty good utilization, but its throughput will be terrible. It will be one for throughput because it's super slow. And so that's where the next step of the explicit free list comes in as a way of improving on the throughput uh, for, uh, uh, for your allocator. Uh, and the explicit free list, as I've outlined it here, should get about a performance index of about 85, which will translate into a 93% on the lab, assuming that you get the style points and the, the check-in points. Then beyond this, it's up to you whether you want to attempt additional optimization. Uh, that will probably be entirely on the utilization side, as with an explicit free list, you're going to max out 40 out of 40 on the throughput. So there would be ways to make it faster, but making an allocator faster is a lot less interesting than making it more memory efficient. Uh, so the lab is uh, structured to, to have put higher weight on the, the utilization side. And so, you could think about placement policy, about splitting policy, about coalescing policy in terms of uh, further designs to explore. Uh, if you're uh, feeling especially adventurous, um, you could try uh, some more sophisticated uh, uh, free list structure, such as a something like a self-balancing tree, uh, would our, our explicit free list. Uh, we still have to search through all the free blocks; they're not in any particular order. 
If we had some uh, self-balancing binary tree, we could use that to find, to more efficiently search for a block of an appropriate size. The textbook talks about things called seg lists or segmented lists. We were maintaining multiple free lists with blocks and kind of different size categories to search more efficiently. There is uh, also an optimization discussed in the textbook uh, where we don't always need a footer, and so we could get away with not having um, uh, not having a footer in our uh, uh, allocated blocks, and keeping track of whether the previous block is allocated in one of our other unused lower order bits. So that could increase, uh, increase utilization uh, as well. The other part of this that I want to emphasize, um, because uh, as you're debugging, this is going to be your absolutely most useful tool. There are two functions provided in the starter code. Uh, print heap and check heap. Calling print heap will print out the state of the heap. Calling check heap will go through all the blocks in the heap and check that the header and footer match, that they are 16 byte aligned, um, that there are, uh, and potentially uh, uh, other things. You are free to, to extend the, these functions as well. But when we're at this very low level implementing this kind of system, uh, system code. One of our best tools is something like check heap, which if we call that at the end of free and at the end of, of malloc, as soon as something goes wrong, check heap's gonna stop the program and say, here's, here's the line where it went wrong. Likewise, if we have some t long test case, and something is going wrong somewhere, one of our best strategies is to, after each, say, call to malloc, print out the heap, and then start looking through it, because it's very likely that the first time something bad happens is well before the program actually crashes, well before that bad thing actually causes the segmentation fault. And so you can look, you can just look through what's what's uh, being printed out, and you might spot, oh, there's a header and footer mismatched, or there's a footer with clearly garbage data, or, oh wait, there is a block smaller than the minimum block size, because I forgot to account for that. Uh, so these these functions are are likely to be your best debugging tools. Of course, GDB also, uh, also a useful tool um, for this as well. The final thing that I want to mention is about what's, uh, what's going on with these uh, pound define. So these pound defines are creating what are called macros, which are just like a, a uh, search and replace. So any time in your code that uh, you have capital get of P, as part of compilation, that will be replaced with the code that appears to the right. So these are essentially functions, but we avoid actually introducing a function call because we're just replacing uh, uh, this code with a code that actually, actually does this. So these uh, macros uh, include these, um, the kind of uh, math to get the header and footer of a current block and the next and previous block using like subtracting a word, getting the size, adding that. So these are, are included in these macros. You don't have to use these. You could write your own functions. Uh, if you do the explicit free list, you'll need to add some new ones to deal with the next and previous pointer. But another good way to start would be making sure you understand what these are doing before you start trying to use them in the lab. All right, over time, so I'll let you go. Uh, 
I look forward to seeing your, your questions on the, the check-in form. Uh, lab 3 due tonight. Uh, office hours at, at 4.30. Otherwise, I'll see you Friday.